It's read with a very specific certain tune and different tunes at different places. Okay, we're in chapter 5. We looked at the entrance of Esther into see Achash Verosh. Phones away, please. Look in your Megillot. Perek Hay, chapter 5. We are on verse 4. And there is a code that Esther and Mordechai have put in this verse over here. Can anyone see the code? It is first letters of four words. The first letter of four words. Look in your Megillot, chapter 5, verse 4, and you're going to see a little extra code that is put in by Esther and Mordechai. Lanat alachet. Enli. Sorry, honey. It's, the, it's four words in that pasuk that start with four different letters that spell another word. It's called Roshe Tevot, the beginning of a word, and it is the way the Torah, and in this case the Megillah, is going to encode something. Michal. Very good, Michal. It is Yavo HaMelech Vahaman Hayom. Yavo HaMelech, the king, should come and should be here today. And Haman. Inside this verse are four letters. And those four letters are Yud with a He and a Vav and a He. God's name is encoded. So we see that the name of God, Shem Havaya, Hashem's name is encoded in the Megillah. And this is one of the cases. What kind of name is the Yud and the He and the Vav and the He? What kind of name is that? God has various names that represent various attributes. So the name of God that is, now I'm going to, I can't write it completely because then I couldn't erase it. So I'm going to do it as Yud. K, Vav, K. But that's Yud with a He and a Vav and a He. What does that name represent? Does anybody know? No. What? No. Nope. Today, nope. Okay. It represents God's name of mercy, of Rachamim. God's name of mercy. It's God's miraculous name. It is a name that was introduced to the Jewish people <clears throat> in Egypt, as they were about to leave, before all the makot, Hashem says to Moshe, I operate this world with different attributes. There's Elohim, that's the name of judgment, of din, and then there's this. This always represents mercy. God's Rachamim. His miraculous name, actually. The miracles that are done are done through this name of Yud, with a He, and a Vav, and a He. It's actually a contraction of three different words. Haya, Hove, Yiye, was, is, will be. God is the past, the present, and the future. He is above time. Let's write this down so you know it. Haya, Hove, Yi, Yeah, past, present, future. When you see that name, good things are happening. Sisters, we're in a good place. And so Esther has fasted for three days. No food, no water. She has walked in threat of her life to see Achashverosh. And if he didn't hold up his golden scepter, she'd be <laughs> dead. He lifts up his golden scepter and she is accepted. There is another code word in the Megillah, the Gemara tells us, that also has got, because God's name is not mentioned explicitly, because God is hidden in the Megillah, but there's another word that appears many times. In the Megillah, that is a reference to God and to somebody else. What is that word? Hamelech, the king. Whenever you see Melech, Esther and Mordechai wrote it with a double meaning. Melech refers to Achash Veirosh, but it also refers to God as well. So when it says, Vatome Esther im ala Melech, if it's good for the king, it's referring to the king, Achashverosh, but it's also referring to the king of kings, who is God. And if it's good for you, God, 
make sure my mission that I'm about to do, which we started speaking about last class, which we're going to talk about more today, was crazy suicide mission, not just walking in, but the plan when she does walk in was insane. Yeah. So very, very good. You're right. Seems you're like God. So God represents himself in this world via kings as well. There is only one God. We know that. But this one word in this world refers to Hamelech, as in Ahasuerus, who was the king of his day. He was the leader of his day, the dictator, actually, a not good Melech, and can also refer to Akarosh Baruch Hu judging the world and being in charge as well. So there's different levels. It's like an onion. It doesn't take away from God's power by using the same name to refer to Ahasuerus. I promise you, it does not. It does not. It's just a code word they needed to do. So now she says, let's do this inside. Follow inside, my dear friends. Let the king and Haman come. El hamishta to a feast, a share, a city, low. What does low mean? For him. What did we say last class? What should it say? She's talking directly to Achashverosh. We assume. Lacha. I made a lovely meal for you. We're going to have shawarma. We're going to have falafel, lafa, hummus, trina, kharif, atarosa kharif. We're going to have all this lovely food. And it should be a direct invite. There is a hint over here of the plan that she was formulating, that she formulated with Mordechai, that her and Haman were in collusions and were in a relationship. It's an insane claim to make because it was putting her life really in danger. But right now, it's a hint. It's a hint. Let's keep going. And the king said, So now the king, God, and Achashverosh, hurry Haman, right, to this special mishta that Esther is making. So there they are at this wine feast, which is one of the reasons that we drink wine on Purim. Right? First of all, to be metakein, the original feast that we went to of Achashverosh and we shouldn't have been at. So that's one reason. And this is another one. This is also to represent this feast of Esther. Look very carefully. I want to look in verse 6. There's two words over here. Two words. You need to know. There's two ways to say what do you want? What do you want? What is your request? And what is your petition? What do you need? Why do you have two different words to describe what she needs? What's going on with that? What do you think? Why do you have two different words to describe exactly the same thing? Obviously, they're not the same thing. Yeah. What you want and what you need. Very good, very good. So what are, the, what are the differences over here for her, for Esther? She needs to save the Jewish people. And what else does she need? She also needs the plan to go accord. Like. You know what, Maya? I'm very impressed. I think you're right. We have two types of need. Her personal request, that is her she'elatech. What is your she'elatech? What can I do for you, Esther, personally? And what can I do for others? In other words, I know you need something from me. You wouldn't have risked your life. He's not stupid, Ahasuerus. You didn't risk your life for no reason. So what do you need personally? What can I do for you, Esther, personally? But do you have something to ask me for somebody else? And then he says, I'll give you even half of my kingdom. Does that sound very loving to you? Yeah. Half, of my, half my kingdom? If he loves, he'd offer her all of her kingdom. Why do we answer? What does the Gemara answer on that? That the other half that he wasn't willing to give her was Yerushalayim, Eretz Yisrael, they had control of at this point. He wasn't willing to give her that up. Assuming he didn't know where she was from, which he didn't, something's very unusual about that, but that's what the Gemara says. Let's keep going. She answers, She'elati uvakashati. I've got a personal request. And I have a national request. Oh, now that's big news. 
What information has Esther withheld from Ahasuerus up to this point, which he is dying to know? Who is she? Where is she from? Everyone loves you, Esther. Everyone is claiming you as their own. Who are you? Who is this amazing, beautiful, graceful leader who was chosen as my wife? Who are you and where are you from? She is going to very soon volunteer that information finally. But she's not there yet. But she hinted it now. I'm going to tell you what I need for me, my she'elati, but I have a bakasha as well for my people. Oh, she's just lowered the fishing rod inside. Look inside. We're on chapter 5, verse 7. Esther, I'm going to tell you what to do. If I've been good to you, my king, Achashverosh, slash Hashem, Vimelach Tovani of good, Latetcha Latila, Sotbekashati, do both, Yavo, Hamelach, Vahaman, El Hamishte. There it is again. Hashem's name is mentioned. She's saying that Hashem, I'm pleading, God, I'm pleading to your attribute of Rachamim, of mercy. Like that's what Hashem's name is doing over here. Do you mind closing the door? Do you mind? Thank you so much. I'm pleading to do your mercy upon me or machar look at the verse uh, I will do exactly what you want you know what she said if you do what I ask you to do I'm going to tell you where am I from and I'm going to finally submit myself to you voluntarily up to this point it had been a forced relationship but I am going to give you everything that you want which this is Esther to Ahasuerus. She knew that she needed to do this in order to save the Jewish people. Half the kingdom, and she's going to ask him to save the entire Jewish people, her people. She's about to reveal her origins, and she's going to submit herself. By the way, she does submit herself, and they do have relations, and she has one chat. She had a miscarriage already, if you remember. Remember that word? Right? When she found out that this decree had come out, she lost a child in absolute fright and horror. She's about to get pregnant again and have one child through Achashverosh, who ends up becoming Dariavesh. Darius is going to come from their relationship, who's going to allow the Jewish people to go back and build the second temple in the days of Ezra. Yeah. And she's going to ask him, and she's going to submit herself to him voluntarily, which she has not done to this point. Up to this point, she was taken against her will, and she's going to allow herself to do that. But she's going to invite them to another feast. Now, Haman is like, he's on a high. Imagine you're Haman, right? One second, my darling. Imagine you're Haman. And you're now powerful, and you're invited to the most personal, private feast of the king and his wife. He is on a high, way, way up there. So he leaves this feast, and this is part of our plan. She wants him to leave full of himself, confident, because the bigger they are, the further they fall. So now Haman leaves this feast. Samech v'tov leiv. He's delighted. Vikarot Haman at Mordechai. And on the way home, he sees Mordechai. Where is Mordechai at this point? How come he just happens to see him? Where, is Ham- Where did Mordechai... I'm not even drunk. I'm already confusing Haman and Mordechai. Where? At the gate of the king. Right? At the gate of the king. What's he wearing? Sackcloth and ashes. Does he bow down to... Haman, no. So now Haman has reached the highest heights and he sees Mordechai and he goes out of his mind. Now remember, he's already made the decree to wipe out all the Jewish people, but he's going to have to wait a long time because the dice fell out for Adar. And we are in Nisan, 11 months before. Bishar Melech, the law come. Mordechai doesn't get up. The law doesn't even move. He doesn't even move when he sees. Everybody else sees Haman and they prostrate themselves. He doesn't even do that. Vimale Haman al Mordechai Chema. He is furious. Furious. Look at verse 10. Vyitapak Haman. Haman controls himself. This was hard because he wanted to cut the guy's head off. But he controls himself. 
he held himself back from killing Mordechai. The Avo El Beitu, he comes home, and there he sees his loved ones, Ohavav, Vet Zeresh Ishto, and his wife Zeresh. Zeresh, by the way, his wife was an extremely evil, despicable individual. Do not join the Zeresh fan club. She was worse than Vashti. She was bad. And now he's got, you know, you have a really great day. You want to come home and tell your family, you won't believe that I've had. So he does exactly that. Visaper lehem hamanet kavod He tells his family, by the way, I am really rich. And the king has elevated me to the highest heights. I am the most powerful person below the king in the entire kingdom. Invited me. And I'm going back for another party. It's amazing. Look at verse 13. There's something unusual. Look at the end letters. So we have two ways. Look at this very carefully. There are two ways that Hashem and Mordechai and Esther encode words. They could be at the beginning of the word or they could be at the end of the word. They could be going forwards they can be going backwards. What do you see in this verse? Look at verse 13 on chapter 5. Can you see something weird happening over here? Look at the words. V'chol ze einenu shoveh li. All of this, all the money, all the power, all the honor means nothing to me because Mordechai won't bow down, bow down to me. You see God's name is backwards at the end of the words, ze is a hey, enenu is a vav, shove is a hey, li is a yud. It's God's names backwards. It's the end of the word and it's back to front. So Haman has, whether knowingly or unknowingly, probably unknowingly, said words that have God's name in it at the end of the words going backwards. So he is the absolute reverse and he's trying to undo God's plan. It's not going to work. But that is encoded in the words, and Mordechai Nest included this, so you can see God's name backwards. You don't want God's name backwards, you want it forwards, right? That is the end letters on verse 13. The word za is a hey. The word enenu is a vav. The word shove is a hey. And the word li is a yud. Can you see it ends with God's name, yud ke vav ke, and they're backwards. He's the antithesis to godliness. And God is working against him. You see it? Yeah. We saw already that when Esther spoke, God's name, yud Hey vav Hey appears at the beginning of the word and goes forward. That's how you want it. When Haman does it, it appears at the end of the words, and it's going backwards. That's a bad sign. Right? Because you want Hashem to be forward with you and not backwards, you know, in its most simplistic. But he's really fighting HaKadosh Baruch Hu's nature and he's about to lose. Okay? Things you would never notice just by reading the Megillah. You see it now? You don't. Look at the word Zeh. Can you see it? What does Zeh end with? A hey. What does Einenu end with? A Vav. What does Shoveh end with? A hey. And Li ends with a Yud. Can everyone see it? I'd circle if I were you, because that's what I did. Okay. That's cray-cray. Because whenever I see Mordechai Yehudi, so he's identifying as the Jew, it's not just Mordechai you hate, it's all the Jews. Can you see that? So he's identifying as you. By the way, we said already, this is the first time in Jewish history all the Jewish people are referred to as Yehudim. And they said, don't worry, darling, Husband Haman, we got this. Yasu eights make a crossbeam. An eight. Take a nice big long chunk of wood, which is, is, gonna, is going to come from a very unusual location. Get, gather in a second. This piece of wood comes from somewhere quite specific. Hold your houses. We get in there, sisters. Yasu eats 
גבוה חמישים אמה, פיפטי אמות, פיפטי אמות. Take a piece of wood, take a piece of wood that is 50 amot. 50 amot, the word ama comes from the word, well, the word arm comes from the word ama. It's about a foot and a half, two feet. You're going to have to find a massive piece of wood that's 50 uh, amot, 75, 100 feet, whatever it is tall. And over boker, emol amelech, tell the king, v'yitluet morachalav, and hang morachai. So morach, get him out of the way. He's obviously annoying you. And he's getting in your way to kill him. The rest of the Jews you'll do later on. But him we're going to do early. And he sat down and he ate and they rejoiced. Here's a great, great... Because he loved the idea. He's like, oh, honey, great idea. Now, if you know the answer to this question, I will be exceedingly impressed because I did not know it at your age. The fact... By the way, I'm going to tell you what the connection is. And then you have to figure out why there's a connection. The Gemara says, why exactly do we know the height of this piece of wood? He's going to hang Mordechai. By the way, the same piece of wood is going to be used to hang Haman later on, by the way. Right? It's called Mida Keneged Mida, which is a big theme in the Megillah, measure for measure. Why do we need to know the height? Why do I care? 20 amot, 50 amot, 1,000 amot, machpatli. Okay, so the bigger you are, the higher you fall. All right. It could be that's why it's so high, but why 50? Ooh! My Aaron, you're on fire today. Is it? Yeah, how'd you know that? Honestly, random, I, I feel like I'm like mixing up like a lot of Jewish day school things in my head. So I can't remember what part is what. So I was kind of just... You got to fish it out, son. It's all there, Ma. It's got to fish it out. <laughs> yeah. Like in the building of Tevat Noah, the Ark of Noah... We know specifically the dimensions of it, and one of the dimensions was 50 amot. How did Haman have access to it, and where was this ark? So at this point, it was available on Mount Ararat, Har Ararat, which was in Turkey, which one of Haman's sons was put in charge of. So he had to... Yeah. Yeah. And for some reason, there was a piece of wood still existing on Noah's Ark on this mountain in modern-day Turkey, of which Haman's son was in control of, and they schlepped it in. Now, why? In Noah's Ark? I guess. Why Noah's Ark is mentioned in the Megillah? We're going to bank that and try to figure that out. That's a good piece of homework. What it is about Noah's Ark that it makes a nice surprise appearance in Megillat Esther. Okay, I have a few answers in my mind, but we're going to leave that for now. That's their plan. Take this piece of wood. It's very high. Everyone's going to see it. You're going to hang Mordechai on this piece of wood. Everything's amazing. Of course, we said that that's not what happens. What happens is Haman and his Ten sons are going to hang on it. And that is the theme that we're going to see again of Mida Keneged Mida. What you want to do are done to others. Let's go back to Vashti. Vashti humiliated the Jewish women and made them strip naked and work for on Shabbat. Mida Keneged Mida. She was killed on Shabbat. Remember that? Yom HaShvi'i. You want to use a piece of wood to kill? You're going to die on this piece of wood. Mida keneged mida. At the end of days, nations, before Mashiach comes, are going to try to do stuff to us. We're going to come along, and Hashem is going to turn the tables. V'nahafachu, a very important word we're going to see later on in the Megillah, and it's all going to fall on you. Mida keneged mida, measure for measure. Which you put out, the spiritual world dumps on you. This is not karma, chas v'chalila. This is Hashem, exacting retribution based upon what you did. There's a, ne- there's a positive too. You do good, you receive good. All right? It's obviously got to work both ways. This is the negative version of it. Mida, keneged, mida. Okay. So now it's looking really bad for the Jewish people because as far as they're concerned, they're all about to die. 
Everyone knew Haman had been elevated to this high position. V chapter 6. Let's go. Belayla hahu nadada shanat hamelech. That night, the king's sleep was interrupted. He couldn't sleep. The king na da da. He could not sleep and he was shaken. Now that means to shake. Shaken, but not stirred. He was shaken up. Which king? And Hashem. Because it had been as though Hashem had Kivyachol fallen asleep. But we know the God of Israel, don't fall asleep. It may appear as though he's sleeping to our requests, right? And not attentive to what we need. That's not happening. Achashverosh wakes up and he's woken up by Hashem, who himself, as it were, is going to wake up and now we're going to see things start to repair and the downfall of Haman is about to begin. Okay, let's have a look. So he can't sleep, he's shaken. Actually, the Gemara says that he actually had a very, very bad dream that he saw Haman coming to attack him, I think, if I remember correctly, and try to kill him. So he starts to get a little more suspicious. Now, whether this was a prophetic dream or because Esther had implanted a seed in his mind that her and Haman are... Woo -woo! Wait, how did she do it? She invited Haman and she said... Yeah, and she said, oh, I'm going to invite him. Uh, I mean you, your majesty. Mm. Dodgy. It's getting a little dodgy. Okay, the Yomer, so he wants to fall asleep. So what do you do when you want to fall asleep? You go online. No, you don't. You call Sefer Hazichronot. You call a book of remembrances. I remember this when I was like little. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much what they did. They read him a bedtime story. What puts you back to sleep? Reading. However, it's much more than that. He basically says, you know what? Haman is out to get me. Someone's going to attack me. He felt something was up. He had this instinct. He had this dream about Haman. And he thinks to himself, you know what? Maybe I owe somebody a favor. Maybe there's something mismatched over here. Maybe I lifted up Haman too high, too quick. He started to doubt himself. He said, bring me the book of remembrances. What book is this? This is the book of favors that he owed people. Did he owe anybody a favor that we know about? For doing what? Did he pay him for saving his life by reporting on the assassination plot of Big Tan and Teresh? Not yet. And so he brings out this book. And they start to read from it. And they start to read, right? right? This was very common, to read speeches for the king. And that sounds a little unusual now. But reading for the king and uh, speech of him is, was used to be very, very common. And he sees in this book, we're in chapter 6, verse 2, He's like, oh yeah. oh yeah, I remember this. A few years ago, Mordechai did a favor for me. And I never paid him back. And maybe something bad's going to happen because of it. Okay? Because of these two guys who work for me end up trying to kill me and they want to get rid of me. And he says, What can I do? What can I do to reward Mordechai? Okay? Because I've not done anything for him. All of a sudden, he hears something in the background. What does he hear? But this is the middle of the night. He hears somebody coming and arriving. Haman. Why is Haman coming to see him? Tell him, I've got a great idea. Let's kill Mordechai. I tried it with all the Jews. I got a thumbs up. I'll try it with Mordechai. Kal if Ahasuerus is willing to kill all the Jews, how much more so is he going to be willing to kill Mordechai? Now put yourself in Ahasuerus' position. Middle of the night, you're suspicious of Haman, and he's coming to see you surreptitiously. Not at two in the afternoon. Middle of the night. What are you thinking? 
Yeah. And he's like, by the way, I know they're assassins because you just read to me about an assassination attempt. So assassin is in his head. So he's like, this guy's going to come. He's trying to kill me. Take my wife and kill me. This is really a big deal. I got myself a big problem. Because he came little lot and Mordechai to ask him to kill Mordechai. That he made. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Look inside, my dear sisters. What does it say? That Mordechai, that Haman had prepared for him. Who's him? Oh, Achashverosh. Achashverosh. Achashverosh is like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're trying to hang somebody over here? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, him. Who to him? Who to him? Mordechai? Or me? So now he's double, double freaking out. Suspicious. Mordechai is going to come to him and say, I want to go and hang him low. Over here, he should have said, Sorry. Scratch that. Haman is coming to tell Askashvashim to kill Haman, uh, Mordechai, and say, hey, I've even got the gallows ready for him. He doesn't see the name yet, he's just like, I want to hang Yeah. Yeah. Two ways to read it. Oh, you want to hang him? And maybe to him is me. Yeah? I shall not be using Mordechai Haman's name again. Okay, you're going to have to figure it out. Oh, by the way, look who's here. Haman's here. Uh, Haman, yeah, good. So bring him in. bring him in. He says, bring him in. He brings him in. And he says to him, now I've got a question for you. So now, Achashverosh is going to test Haman's loyalty. Test Haman's loyalty. Now, Haman is not aware of this. Remember, we have two conversations here. Yeah? This is the setup, the Mordechai and Esther plan. Haman comes and says, I want to kill Mordechai. Achashverosh is suspicious and says, well, let me test him out. Let's see what happens if I bring up this idea of Mordechai to him. Let's see how he reacts. So watch carefully. Yeah, he's testing Haman right now. Yeah. He says, let's see there's somebody who I want to really honor. The king? Yeah, 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 yeah. But he's testing him to see, he wants to see his loyalty. He's checking his loyalty. It's a test. He's giving him a lie detector test. Oh, he said it, but who knows? Who knows what his real implications are? What are his real implications over here? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. But he doesn't say it so clearly. It could be him he's trying to kill. So Achashverosh is in, he's, he's, he's getting suspicious. So the king knows at this point. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so, yeah. I believe he does, yeah. But before he does, he even preempts him and says, Oh, by the way, by the way, you know, I owe somebody a favor, a great person, a good person. How would you go around honoring somebody that did me a great favor. What does Haman think? Because he's an egoistic, narcissistic little beast. So he thinks he's talking about me. So he plays right into Esther and Mordechai's trap that they set up. They're not even there. Because they started to implant inside Ahasuerus' mind that Haman is after your job. And they implanted in Haman's mind that you are the best thing that's ever happened. And he bought it hook, line, and sinker. So they just had to like put them together, right? And how did Mordechai do that by not bowing down to him? So he suspected that he was going to go and try to make an assassination attempt against Mordechai. It's complicated, right? It's about to get worse. And he said, I got a great idea. Bring clothing. There's clothing again. Put it down. You should have at least seven examples of clothing in your repertoire of clothing... Um, mentions, bring great majestic clothing. Now, at this point, Haman really thinks that Achashverosh is talking about him. But Achashverosh 
knows Haman's thinking this. You get it? But he's actually talking about Mordechai. Thank you. I would have got that one wrong. Asher Hashem Melech Vesus and get me a, a, a horse. Asher Rachav Alav Hamelech Vasher. Now watch this. This is going to be his ultimate downfall. We're on verse eight in chapter four. Nitan Keter Malchut Barosho. This was his big, fat, delicious mistake. He says, by the way, put a crown on his head. Put a crown, a keter, onto his rosh. Whose head are we talking about? There's three possibilities. Haman says to Haverish, dress him up, royalty, put him on the royal horse, and put a crown on his head. So he could be referring to his own head. That's who Haman's referring to. Or he could be referring to... But he doesn't think Mordechai at all. He doesn't suspect Mordechai is being requested over here. He means the horse's head. So make it even fanciful. But most likely he was referring to his own head. That's how Achish Feyush... Achishver says, oh, oh, you think I'm talking about you and you want a crown in your head? Who has the crown? Only the king. He's like, that's it. Now, suspicion went from like 20% and now it's moved to about 70, 80. This was a big shift in his suspicion of Haman getting too big for his boots. You've got to bring him down. How are you going to bring him down? How are we going to bring Haman down? So Achashverosh wants to bring Haman down a little bit. What's he going to do? He's like, great idea. Dress up Mordechai and you are going to walk him through town yourself. And he says, and he's going to announce, this is what we do. Grab the clothing and the horse, and do exactly what he wanted, Le Mordechai. He's like, I'm sorry, what did you just say? Can you imagine Haman? He's like, I'm sorry, sorry. We were talking about me, weren't we? It was, it was all about me, me, me. And Nachshverosh says, no, 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 no. I'm talking about Mordechai, Mordechai, Mordechai. You're going to march him. Let's bring you down, and you're going to march him through the streets as a big official, and make a big fanfare, and everyone's going to see you this is the tipping point. We're into the top of the mountain. Here is Haman at the top. Can you see? Invited to the feast, rich, and now is the beginning of his decline. The plan of Mordechai and Esther is now starting. La Mordechai, and maybe Haman would say, well, there's various Mordechais. He says, Mordechai, hey, Yehudi. He goes, but there are many Jewish Mordechais. Which Mordechai are you talking about? He knows exactly, but he's trying to get out of it, right? Hayoshev Bishar Melech. There's only one Mordechai who's Jewish sitting at the gate of the king. So he says, don't try to get around this with a little funkle monkle of trying to find another Mordechai and honoring him. There ain't no out here, brother. Right? You're done. You're done. Al tapel Don't change it. When the king said it, the king meant it. This is an extremely, I can't repeat this too many times, extremely powerful individual. There it is again. He takes the clothing and the horse and he dresses Mordechai. And he marches him through the streets of Shushan. Habira. And he has to announce. And this is what you get for being good to the king. And this is what you get for trying to rebel against the king. Right after this whole marchy thing, yeah. Good to the king. That's what he had to announce. But for him, this is what happens if you're not good. Right? Watch yourself, Haman. You better watch yourself. Don't get too big for your boots. Right afterwards, so now, Mordechai is elevated to the highest place, but right afterwards, Haman goes to his home, and 
Mordechai goes back where? After all this pomp and ceremony, he puts on the sackcloth and ashes again. He goes back to the gate of the palace and he goes back to mourning because the Jewish people are still about to die in less than a year. Right? He goes back to exactly where he was. Look at verse 12. We see a little hint over here. Avel v'chafoy rosh. He goes back. Now, usually they translate as Avel as he goes back despondent. Now, Haman is a little upset, right? He wasn't who he used to be. But Avel means mourning, yeah. Avelut. Why? Because his daughter had just died. There's a very famous description in the Gemara how his daughter, he had one daughter, Haman. And she had seen them, and she'd taken the refuse bucket from inside her house, had seen someone marching somebody else, assumed that, and she threw the dirt, thinking she hit Mordechai, she hits her father. She realized what happens. She threw herself from the roof and died. She committed suicide. Because she had embarrassed her father. She saw what happened to her father, and she felt so mortified by this that she killed herself. She dies in the process. That's why the word Avel is over there, that Haman is Chafwe Rosh. He covered his head, which is a sign that you are an Avel. So now he goes home, and he has a very different story to the early one. Vesaper Haman Lazeresh, Ishto, L'chol Avav. He tells him everything that happened at Asher Karahu. Now we've seen that word before. Karahu. Karahu. He tells everything that happened to him. You won't believe what happened to me. Everything was going great. I was about to hang. And then I ended up having to schlep through the streets. What does the word kara mean there, we said? What does it mean? It's a code word for a malek and their way of thinking. What is kara? What does makara mean? What happened? It's all coincidence. Even this didn't wake him up. Even this didn't make him You know what? Maybe I should stop this whole Mordechai fascination obsession. Just let the guy live. No! I'm going to tell you what just happened to me. Was something like Yes, because they're the people who call down Hashem's name in this world. Yeah, that's exactly it. But it's also, Karahu literally means, Kar means cold. But Karahu, it just happened. Happenstance. A Malik are all about stuff just happens. Right? There's no God. There's no plan. There's no subtext. There's no context. It all just happens. However, even his own ministers and family are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold your horses. Literally, hold your horse. He's like, you know what? This is not a good sign. So his wife wakes up and his advisors wake up and his kids wake up and they're like, no, 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 no. And by the way, why did he choose hanging, by the way? Just for interest. Why did he choose hanging as well? Why don't he just like bang him on the head or kill him with a sword or drown him or... What? Okay, publicly drown him. Okay, gather him onto the beach and drown him. I don't know. Well, he figured out, he's like, well, you know, this whole God thing of theirs, yeah, they survived water at the Yamsuf. Moshe was attacked with the sword. They survived the sword. He went through all the different ways that Jews have been tried to be killed up to this point, And there'd never been an instance of Jewish people being hanged. He's like, yeah, let's go with that. That's why he chose it. So it's public. But also he's like, mm -hmm. I've never seen them escape the whole hanging thing. Maybe that's uh, not where their luck is. So that's where he chose hanging. Anyway, so he's later I'm like, listen, this guy's Jewish, right? Miseri Yodim. Obviously, they're about to go up. You're about to go down. And he's like, Ki enough old tip of enough. It's, you're going to have bad luck from this. It's not going to work. Just stop your plan. Now his wife's getting involved. And everyone knows when your wife has advice for you, you listen. That's only if you're Jewish. If you're a Malik, you don't. <laughs> no. Haman's mishpacha is like, stop, forget about it, you're obsessed. 
Mordechai is living in your head rent free, right? Which was what Mordechai exactly really wanted. You know those, those people who want to hurt you, they want to get inside your head. He, he was being, you know what this is? He was being trolled by Mordechai. Mordechai was trolling him. That's 2024. Right, he was getting on him. He was making all these, you know, posts on social media. He's getting into his head. He's living in his head rent-free. That's exactly what he's doing. Mamash. While this conversation is going on, Oda Medabrim. Remember we said Achar means right away? Oda means like while it's going on. So they're talking to him. Right? I always picture him around the kitchen table. It's like a family summit. And they're like, listen, it's not good. Just stop. The whole Mordechai thing, they're having an intervention. Stop. Forget about it. He doesn't get a chance to even respond. While he's still speaking, the soldiers of Ahasuerus drag him out and bring him to a second feast. Because the only request that Esther has, I think we missed this out, unfortunately, was to bring Haman and Mordechai to a second feast. Why a second feast? She's building up. Nope. So all she said was, I yep. She's like, you want to know? Come to the second feast, and I'm going to tell you everything, and I'm going to do everything for you. Now, the second feast is not like the first. In the first feast, she didn't eat anything. She didn't drink anything. She actually been fasting for three days, garnished. Now, she starts to chill out. She has a little schnapps, a little bit of vodka to loosen her. I'm making this up. Right? But you get the idea. But she does eat there. So im means with. So Esther is now, she's eating now. So Achashverosh is like, okay, I see you're doing better now. Because he was very upset for her. And now she's got her color back. She's eaten after a three-day fast. She's drunk. And they're at the second day and the second feast. And he says, what is your shelotech, amalka, ma'abakasha? Same thing he asked at the first feast. And she says, here we go. Here it comes. This is chapter 7, verse 3. Gimel. It's just them three? Just them three. It's always just them. Vetan esta malka. And she says, if you still love me, and I find great grace in your eyes. Ve'im ala melech tov, tenaten li nafshi, save my life, don't kill me from what I'm about to tell you. Because he could turn around and be like, you're dead. Bishelati va'ami, and I'll tell you who I am. This is my am, v'akashati. And please listen to my people's request. What is the people's request? Don't kill us. There's a decree coming up in about 10 months' time at this point, or less. Please, please don't kill my people. Because there's been a decree against my people, the Jewish people. It doesn't mention, by the way, it just says my people. It doesn't say they're Jewish. Because later on, it's going to not look so good for Rakhashvesh when he reads the Megillah and says that this decree was there to kill all the Jewish people. It doesn't want to be like, it doesn't want that impression. It's like my people. And they want to take us and they want to kill us and wipe us out. And they want to take us as slaves and on his left. And it doesn't make sense to you, great, wise, amazing mwah, king. Right? You've got you to kiss up to this Meshuggah. He's a complete majnun divaneh, this guy. What are you going to do? She turns, he turns around to her and says, Mi hu zeh. The A Z who? Who are you talking about? At this point, he's got suspicions, but he's not sure. Who wants to do this to you? Right? We are on chapter 7, verse 5. Who are you talking about? Who are you talking about? He actually didn't know. He actually did not know. Who wanted to do this? She says, ha, this is cute. She says, it's a very bad man. He's a bad person. Ish Haman Harasha. 
this bad Rahman. And actually at this point, they say, she pointed at, well, he says, who wants to do this to you? She pointed at Achashverosh, because he was the one, and then an angel came, it says, and moved the hand to Haman. So it's like this. So it's kind of like you, but it's via him. See that? <laughs> she, she, she ain't messing around. <laughs> she got guts. She points at, he says, who's doing this to you? And she's like, first points at Achashverosh, and then points at Haman and says, he's the one. So Haman did not see this coming. He had no clue that she's Jewish, because no one did. He had absolutely no idea. Haman, or is that the Haman? Nivat. Nivat. I mean, he's in terror. He's like, what? He cannot believe this. He just literally, everything he believes, like his entire life came crashing down in one second. Imagine you're the highest of the high at the most intimate party, party number two, and now you're going right down. Now, Hama Akashverosh goes planet mental because now he's like, wow, Haman's trying to take my wife, take my kingdom. Now, even she admits to having this relationship with him. That's why she needed mercy for herself because he could have killed her at this point, right? So she, he's furious. She could be dead in a minute too. He could be like, well, you two having an affair together? You're both dead. The Melech come, he gets up. I mean, now he's freaking out. The Mishter, and he went to his garden. He had beautiful gardens and he wanted to chill out. The Haman, Haman, Ahmad, Levakesh al Nafshosa. Haman now realizes O M A. O my Amalek. And he says, I've got, to, I've got to plead with her for my life. She's got the keys to my, my life right now. Yeah? So he pleads with her and he goes to pleads for his life. And while he's doing this, this is like, this is like the perfect end of the... Well, it's not the end of the movie yet because we're still going to have a problem after this. As Ahash Verush gets back to the room, Haman had gone down, no fell on the meat on her bed, on her bed because they used to sit and recline on beds in those days when they ate at feasts. And as it all works out coincidentally, as it were, as he sees her on the bed, right? Like on top of her. He's actually pleading for his life, right? He's like, but Achashverosh says, wow. Wow, after all, you ungrateful little rat, after all I've done for you, and now you're trying to violate or slash kill my beautiful Esther. Right? I'm, I'm here! And you're trying to do this? And he says, Haman Chafu. They covered over the face of him. Now, when they covered over the face of a criminal, that means... They're never going to be seen again. You cannot look at the face of the king ever again. Haman Chafu. Right? This was like it. This was it. About to meet a very weird character. His name was Charvona. We don't know precisely who he was, but one opinion is that he was one of Ahasuerus' advisors, who's about to tell him what to do. And the other opinion is, is actually Elu Navi who turned up, who told Ahasuerus what to do. And what's he going to tell him to do? Hang Haman on the same gallows that you wanted to hang Mordechai from Mida, Keneged, Mida, Vyoma, Charvona, Echad, Misar, Simla, Fnei, Amelach, Gam, Hina, Etz, also this tree that you wanted to hang Mordechai from that's 50 amot high hang Haman from it the yitlu et Haman ala eight and they hanged Haman from this wood asher hechin Mordechai that was actually prepared for Mordechai the Hamat HaMelech and the king's anger shachacha was abated which king? Achashverosh was the king. He'd now calmed down because Haman's dead. 
and Hashem Kivyachol, he'd been angry because they went to the feast and they'd done these things, right? And they'd bow down to... And he's like, Hashem also, his anger, Lo'aleinu, for the Jewish people had also been abated and reduced. Okay, questions. We did a lot today, yeah. Um, the Sarisim, the people around him, they covered his face. Why? That was a sign that you're about to be killed, and you can't. Once you had a decree of death on you, you couldn't look in the the, um, the face of the king ever again. It's an embarrassment. By the way, they said I think if you caught his face, you did see it, he'd have to forgive you. If I remember correctly, I think the Gemara says that. So they covered his face. They put a black bag over his head. All right, they're about to take him off to the gallows. That's pretty much what they did. And then also, who was the guy? And what was his, his name was Harvona. It's weird because we sing about Harvona after the Megillah is read. And Harvona is seen as like, you know, a traitor against... One minute he's with Haman and then he turns the tables and he kind of like takes the side of the Jewish people and suggests that Haman should die. Yeah. I know. Isn't he good? <laughs> so the Gilui of Elio Navi um, is very common. We see it throughout Jewish history. The Gemara tells stories of people who walk through marketplaces. Elia Navi's um, arrival at various times, first of all, is connected in a few ways. First, we know that the Purim story we're going to see is actually a template for the coming of Mashiach. And we know Elia Navi is going to be the one to announce Mashiach. So when great redemptions happen, Elia Navi is there. That's why we invite Elia Navi to our Pesach Seder as if to say, we're still celebrating the Exodus, the first one. How about bringing Mashiach to the final one? Because the Navi is the one, says so the prophet Malachi, Malachi, who's going to announce the arrival of Mashiach. Yeah? So he's there. When, we, when Hashem wants stuff to happen in this world, he brings along Elia Navi to come and bring redemption. What is he like? He never like died. Yeah, his neshama comes back into this world, but takes on various guises and forms. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. That's the best way. His neshama comes back into this world and is put into God. Just like, I mean, angels do the same thing, but he's not a malach. He's not a malach. Yes, he was a person, yeah. But he went to Shemaim Shalem. He could be anywhere. Actually, we many places at the same time. Taking on different forms. He could be here right now in our room. Look around. There's at least 50 possibilities in this. You never know. Yeah. So, um, Harbon, Harbon? Harbona. Harbona. Yeah. Is, people say that that could be a relevant Yeah. Yeah. And, um, okay. And when we say it again. The Talmud says Harbona was actually one of the conspirators to hang Mordechai, and he turned the tables and became the uh, reason that, um, Oh, there's another opinion. It was Elio Navi, I believe. So yeah. Two, two different opinions, yeah. Um, okay. Wait, one more question. Yeah. Um, when, you say, when you mentioned Karahu again, I just, you wrote on the board. Karahu is, it just happened. That's how Mordechai and Amalek see the world as coincidence. Look what just happened to me. Not that, oh my God, the Jewish people and God and all this kind of stuff that we're used to. It's like, no, this weird stuff just happened to me. He couldn't learn his own lesson from his own life. Yeah, but he's not seeing any reason why it was. He wasn't attributing all these events to God. Okay. Is that the end of the story? I mean, it should be, right? We should end at, end at chapter 7. And yet we have chapter 8, 9, and 10 still to come. Why? What, what, what's the problem? Why does it... The, the end. Roll the credits. Director. God. Producer. Mordechai and Esther, right? Who played Esther? I don't know, Scarlett Johansson. Who played Mordechai? Okay, I'll do it. Why does it end like that? Why? What, what's the problem over here still? Why is the story still going on? Haman's dead. The bad guy's dead. Once the bad guy dies, right, we all decide, yeah, I get on my horse and ride off into the sunset. Boop, 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 boop. Yeah. The decree is still out there. The decree is still out there. The decree is still out there. And my friends, reversing the decree is going to be a lot 
more complicated, complicated and challenging than killing Haman. And that's why it's going to take a couple of more chapters, which we're going to do. We're going to finish this off next class in Mitzvah Shem and see how Mordechai and Esther were able to reverse the decree against the death of the Jewish people. We'll pick that up in Mitzvah Shem on Thursday. Have a great and successful day, friends.